no rational reason for me that like convex should be have fallen as far as it did given how bullish the developments for convex have been over the past like couple of years though those two just like don't add up to me it seems and still seems super cheap not financial advice but like go out there and buy some convex <laughs> greetings everybody welcome to flywheel your number one source for everything frax DeFi, and all that's in between if you want to know what's going on in the world on chain well you come to the right place this is DeFi Dave here with Capital K, and we are here to help you harness the power of the flywheel. And speaking to someone who understands flywheels very well, we have on the Garrett Hall, the missionary of the Curve ecosystem. Been at it with the Curve Cap newsletter for a hot minute. Uh, and second time on the show, great to have him on. You know, we go into a bit on what's going on in the world of Curve with the release of Llama Land, the performance of Curve USD the general state of DeFi, talking about Convex a bit, talking about Frax a bit, talking about AI a bit. Yeah, we get into AI. Uh, so I'll, there's a little bit of everything for this one. Uh, Kit, what are your thoughts? It's just a good vibe session. No notes needed. Kick your feet up no and notes. just relax. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And if you enjoy this show and every show after that, you know what to do. Go ahead and subscribe. Hit that bell button. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you're watching this on X Twitter, make sure – you give this a like, retweet, reply. If you follow, if you follow us on all of our socials at Flybo DeFi on Twitter, TikTok, and Telegram. Follow us on Farcaster at Flywheel. And if you want to subscribe to your newsletter, go to flywheeldefi.com. Go ahead, subscribe. You'll thank yourself later. If you want to follow me on Twitter? I'm DeFi Dave twenty two, and I'm Farcast. I'm DeFi Dave. You can follow me at zero x capital underscore k. And let's get the flywheel spinning. Do you hold ETH but don't know what to do with it? Want to earn those juicy liquid staking derivative yields but don't know where to start? Well, Frax ETH is there for you. Frax ETH is Frax's native LSD solution, allowing you to earn boosted yields in multiple ways on your ETH. If you want to get started, go to app.frax.finance and turn your ETH into Frax ETH today. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Flywheel. I'm your host, DeFi Dave, joined once again by Capital K. And this time around, we have our brethren from the other side of the Curve Convex Frax trifecta of an ecosystem. We have on CurveCap, Garrett Hall, DevRel at Curve, at, at Curve, and he, you know, you do everything at Curve, I feel like. You're like, you're like the voice of reason and founder of Leviathan News. So, uh, CurveCap, of Gar I should I just say Garrett or CurveCap? Does it matter? Garrett's fine, yeah. Garrett's fine, yeah. Garrett, great to have you on again. Uh, I believe you're like one of the top shows that we've had in terms of views mm -hmm. on flywheel so it's good to get you back on uh you know it's been over a year and a lot has changed a lot has evolved we went from everybody talking about lsds and lsts to now everybody talking about l2s curve has since come out with a stable coin and today llama lend i believe was uh deployed out in, into the ether no pun intended so there's a ton to go over uh but just to start off uh, since you're the Curve man, uh, what is the state of the Curve ecosystem right now? Is it stronger than ever? Uh, or what else is at play? Yeah, it's pretty wild to me to see like just how all of these things are coming together. Um, so... Like, you know, obviously the Frax, like you guys are used to like shipping a ton of products like all the time at Curve. Like mm -hmm. sometimes you have to wait like months or sometimes years between like some of the big launches. So when they come like it's yeah, it's a pretty exciting deal. Like as you mentioned, there's the everything that we've seen happening with Curve USD over the past six months, which has been um, you know phenomenal in my opinion. It's been holding its uh, stability on top of like fulfilling sort of all of the like promises for what it was expected to like do, um, and it's just been like a pleasure to see that's like uh, starting to take shape and starting to get like more and more integrated throughout yeah, DeFi. What was those promises uh, that were expected about CRV USD? So I would say that the, uh, like there was an intense focus on the curve USD peg, right? Like they have all these kind of like complex mechanics, like the peg keepers um, and 
like just as much as possible going into it to try and like you know uh, you, you might have seen it like where like it dips like a fraction of a penny below a dollar and all of a sudden like the borrow rates like will spike up dramatically to push it back or it will, like mm-hmm. just tick like a fraction of a cent above a dollar and like the um the interest rates will like drop very suddenly um so we knew that it was going to be like an intense focus on keeping the peg um but what's mm-hmm. nice about it is it's worked right like we've seen the worst the worst it got was like nearing half a cent off peg at which point like borrow rates spiked to like uh high double digits and uh as a game of chicken someone eventually repaid um and since then it's been uh it's been solid so like then the like the given that it's like proven out it's like ability to like all the mechanics work and the ecosystem is there like then the focus has been to like where can we drive supply and demand uh essentially like where can we get liquidity sinks for curve usd like and that comes with people integrating it into other applications in DeFi, uh getting it spread onto all the explosion of l2s um every time that happens like that's more curve usd that kind of like sits off the market and is uh mm-hmm. not necessarily going to be repaid easily um which just stands to like kind of keep that tvl sticky and keep it growing so we're in around like uh, 150 million tvl for curve usd uh i think it's gonna just keep going up as we kind of see more and more liquidity sinks um and you know like we've all been waiting for this DeFi bull market and maybe it maybe it's here maybe it's here with uniswap turning on the fee switch today. right <laughs> holy shit i was not expecting that i don't think anybody this was like the stone cold bottom maybe it's a return to value maybe maybe this is De- DeFi's triumphant comeback uh what are your thoughts on uniswap turning on the, that fee switch and what it means yep. for DeFi? yeah i think it's uh good for them like i think the like I've been paying attention to DeFi now for like several years, and it's just not really been interesting to pay too much attention to the Uniswap ecosystem because there hasn't been that much interesting stuff coming out, right? Like their token has just sat there um, and done nothing. Mm-hmm. So it's like there's just never anything like worth like digging into on it. Uh, so I'm happy for them if they start to get um, get some like get some interesting tokenomics, uh, some of these fun Ponzi games uh, into their ecosystem. And we'll see, right? Like, it's just a proposal. There's a million ways it can fall apart. It's uh, rugged a million times before. Yeah, um, we've seen this one come about before. <laughs> but the fact that it's from their, like, governance lead or something, that that's right. why everybody's like, oh, this is, like, it's finally happening. But yeah, this one's not a drill. Um, and, you know, like, we'll, we'll see, like, if it's actually a good thing for Uni or not, because I feel like a fair amount of their token valuation was just the, it was pure hopium. Um, but once you actually start delivering revenue to a token, like if it's not quite enough, we'll see if they can uh, sustain that multiple yeah. or not. I feel like there was only so much hopium to go around and I, you just kept on seeing it reach new all time lows against ETH and Bitcoin that they had to do something and probably something yeah. got passed in legal or legal was just like YOLO. And then they decided to put up this proposal for the free switch. So I think it's great for DeFi. I think this will bring more interest back into DeFi and be like, oh, wow, we can actually value things based off of uh, certain methodologies and profit and revenue and streams and all this stuff. And Kit, that's more your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, so I actually, when, when I saw this, first I was excited and then I was scared because expectations <laughs> will always far exceed actual like the actuality of things are going to be just not as good. And when we see this fee switch, first question, okay, is it sizable enough, meaning the rev share for the token holders to be like, hell yeah, you know, we're so back. Or is it going to be too little where it's kind of like not inconsequential? And then second effect is, will the LPs stay there if they have to start sharing the fees? You know, so then like all of these, like, what if, what if, what if was just compounding yeah. for me. But, you know, for some reason, LPs have stuck around Uniswap, even though like there's been all the studies mm-hmm. that most of them don't like actually make money. So if they stuck around while losing money all this time, I don't see why they disappear yeah. just now. Um, well, well, I feel like this could no, be like the like, straw that breaks the I, I've seen back. some of the like, could or be. unicorns could be. back. The straw that breaks the unicorns <laughs> back. Or it could be the uh, the token pumped and everyone, uh, everyone sold off and now they're out. <laughs> Yeah. And so uh, going back into uh, Curve land, um, you said that the current circulating supply of Curve USD is around 150 million. And it's, I think it's kind of stuck around there. What do you think it will get to, you know, be maybe like 500 million or a billion? Um, 
to like to scale up to that. It has it really been a kind of like slow and steady. Let's make sure everything's stable. Like let's make sure that the peg is in check, and then move on to the next level. Um, what has been the growth strategy for Curve USD? Um, so it's entirely been just market forces driving it at this point, right? So mm -hmm. and it's not at all been anywhere near stable around that. Like it's been like massively fluctuating. So mm -hmm. you basically saw like. It was launched, uh, there was like this kind of like fortuitous run up and then the cur first the Conic half happened. Um, at that time, like Conic Finance was the uh, primary source of, uh, the, the epicenter for all the liquidity. Like everyone was just taking their Curve USD, putting it into Conic. Um, it had its own kind of interesting like effects on the market because it was so dominant that it was like single-handedly like causing this like feedback loop back into Curve. Um, uh, so it was having like there was some like work being done in terms of like trying to rebalance the conic liquidity allocation, and then it just disappeared. Um, so that's like the first time Curve uh, USD like not went above a hundred million, and then it kind of like went back. Um, you know, then there was the Curve hack, so everything went back to the doldrums for a bit, um, and then it went back to one hundred fifty million, dropped back below a hundred million, and then in past. Uh, recent weeks shot back up above 150 million again. So it's incredibly volatile. Um, but in my opinion, like the most recent run up, it's been like the best conditions for Curve USD. Because um, as I mentioned, like the thing that's most important for Curve USD adoption is liquidity sinks. Um, you need Curve USD that's essentially off the market that's not just going to like disappear quickly. Um, mm -hmm. If it's if it's too close, uh, so if you take Curve USD and you like immediately trade it out to um, like Tether or USDC, you know, that causes like just very slight like pressure on the Curve USD price, which causes rates to go up, et cetera. Um, but if it's held as Curve USD and not transacted into something else, that's what allows you to kind of have like massive that growth. Monetary premium growing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, in the that's llama been, economy. And that's been happening much more lately. So um, like you might have noticed like Curve has been paying more attention to side chains than it ever did before. Uh, and a lot of it mm. will be like Curve USD will just be emitted broadly as streaming rewards, generally from Mitch's pocket um, once they like launch <laughs> all these pools. And it's like there's a method to that madness because if there's a lot of Curve USD on Arbitrum or Optimism or Fraxtal, wherever, like, wherever Curve USD winds up, um, it doesn't usually get bridged back quickly to L1, right? Like you can sometimes find bridges that go somewhat fast, um, but usually it just sits there. And it's usually been like spread to maybe a few hundred, a few thousand people's wallets in the amount of like 10, 20, 100 bucks like that they got in rewards. If you have like 100 bucks sitting on an L2, you're not going to be doing much with that. It just kind of sits there and like... Um, it's it's a liquidity sink of sorts. Uh, there's now like 30, 40 some million Curve USD on side chains. Uh, so you're talking oh, wow. about like, yeah, like oh, a wow. pretty significant amount that is, you know, of course, some of it will find its way back, but there's enough of it that's just kind of like being now integrated into other applications around all these L2s uh, that's probably going to stay there. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see the, like the, the conditions are in place to continue to see the Curve USD uh, supply rising. And speaking of other Curve products, uh, Llama Lend was released today. I have to admit, I'm sorry, I haven't looked into Llama Lend at all. I'm not familiar with how it works like I am familiar with Curve USD. So for myself and Kit and the viewers at home who may not be familiar with Llama Lend, what is it? How does it work? How is it different than other lending protocols? And what does it mean for the, the Curve ecosystem? Yeah. So the good news is it's almost exactly the same code as Curve USD. So if you understand Curve USD, you can okay. pretty easily understand Llama Land. Um, the big difference oh. is that Curve USD, um, the contracts are authorized to basically mint new Curve USD, right? And this is why it's like sensitive in that no one, like you can't just accept like Dogecoin or like um, Shiba Inu for like minting Curve USD because like, because it has that capability of minting Curve USD, it could become systemically damaging if mm. you know someone like like some garbage token got in there. Um, it would threaten like Curve USD itself. So there has to be like DAO approvals behind it. Um, there's only been like a few type of assets, basically wrapped Bitcoin and various like Ethereum LSTs uh, that have been 
kind of approved for curve usd um llama lend is much more like um the factory is open anyone can launch their own markets anything goes and you probably can and will see like a variety of like just complete like garbage tokens as well as like a lot of great tokens um launching their own um their own like uh one-way lending markets which will have the same sort of like ui and interface is curve usd uh, so instead of of course the token being minted it relies on someone supplying that token and getting the okay. interest from the lending so are these isolated pools is it or is it okay so it's all like isolated Frax-Lend. all isolated exactly. pools. uh are they is it similar to frax lend where you can only borrow you can lend and borrow frax and you can use certain assets as collateral but it's like factory so like anybody if i have like shiba I can make Shiba collateral to like borrow. It's permissionless. So it could be curve USD. It could be Frax. It could be anything, right? Yeah. So it's permissionless. I'm, um, uh, I'm a little unclear on some of the details cause I've seen some conflicting things. Um, I've seen one report that it has to have curve USD as one of the tokens. Um, mm. but then I'm not, I'm not hundred percent, uh, sure if that's, um, entirely accurate. It also needs to have a price Oracle. Um, which is generally going to be like a curve, um, one of the newer generation curve pools that have the built-in price oracle. So it'll probably be a lot of curve pools, um, LP tokens that are um, oh, being used. Loop that, loop that. <laughs> yeah. So you can see, you can you can already imagine where that's like helpful. I've also seen some reports that like um, that Curve USD is not like or Curve is not directly earning fees from Llama Land, but um, from the Curve USD like effects on the ecosystem and like the greater utility for Curve USD. Um, it's Curve USD itself that's the cash cow, and this is just like a utility to kind of drive more utility for that. Yeah, and is there anything else on the Curve roadmap coming up? Like we got Llama Land, we got CRV USD. Uh, do we, oh, which Dave, we Dave, yeah, go ahead. yeah. Dave, before we jump into the, the next product, can I ask some questions around the, yeah. the, the oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So after the pool is, is stood up, does curve, you know, engage in any AMO like functions where you guys would effectively mint CRV USD and just kind of drop it in there? Um, or is it only up to the market to do the supplying? Yeah, so the Llama Land pools have to be like somebody supplying. There's no Curve USD directly minted to it. Uh, I do okay. believe that there is some sort of like um, way of directing emissions uh, from the Curve DAO to uh, the pools. So I believe it might be possible um, that people who are like lending out the token will be able to like be rewarded from the DAO for doing so. Uh, so there might be incentive to like, for example, supply Curve USD to it. Got it. And, and you mentioned curve lp token but is it possible to do like drop it into convex and then get the convex balance <laughs> as the collateral or or no or you you got to choose between either leverage or yield that's a good question get, like I... staked convex loop that around that would be <laughs> pretty cool that'd be pretty cool um so yeah i i think we're just gonna have to like wait and see what the actual factory okay, looks like got it, um, got it. like yeah yeah. So, um, wait, was that, was that a kit? That was good. That was good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So let's go, let's go a bit more on like, what's, what should we expect from the curve roadmap, uh, coming up for 2024? So, uh, you know, the devs are never going to like give an official roadmap, especially. Same curve, thing with frats. <laughs> yeah. We get it. We, um, they ship when so, they ship in stealth, ship in stealth. Yeah. So I think that, um, I think like what I'd say the story of 2024 might be would just be the kind of big efforts of 2023 coming into fruit, like uh, like mm. re- actualizing their potential a little bit. Like there are two major launches from uh, 2023, uh, one of which was Curve USD, um, which I, you know, it's, it did pretty well, but it's, um, it's kind of like only been like, I okay, guess. So it did, it did um, hit above a hundred million for the end part of, of 2023 um but spent most of 2024 above that mark and probably going even higher um that's obviously like been like a huge like cash cow and i think it's going to like continue growing especially with like the potential resurgence in DeFi and like all the fortuitous trends um and if so like that is going to like be a pretty major like um and reshuffle the curve uh ecosystem and then i'd say that the like undersung thing that's also kind of like coming into its potential uh, really only since this past month has been the release of the newer generation stable swap pools. Mm -hmm. Um, So 
a lot of like a lot of stuff got held up in 2023 while we were waiting for like these to get through all the audits and everything. Um, just a like completely kind of like redone version of the original stable swap pools uh, with a lot of extra features like built in price oracles, the capability of handling like up to eight tokens, um, a lot of efficiencies built into it. And they, uh, for like most of the time since these had launched, we'd kind of seen like a lot of the volumes were still mostly like, going through like a lot of the legacy routes. Um, but in the past month, really the like volume going through the stable swap implementations has really picked up. So I'm assuming uh, what's happened is like a lot of like searchers and like um, uh, aggregators probably have like finally started to index it and like build it into their routing. Um, but like we're seeing like a huge uptick in volume that's been running through a lot of these stable swap pools. Oh, uh, so this new generation of stable swap pools, is this V3? Uh, this is the, if you see any of the pools, like they're tagged with NG, NG for next okay. generation, next generation. Uh, okay. <laughs> or new generation. New it's generation. Not a, it's... Speaking I... of a new, wait, what were you going to say? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like default to next generation. Cause I think it's like okay. better for memes, but yeah. Speaking of a next generation of stables, uh, we recently saw Athena coming out strong out the gate. Uh, I think it's above 420 million TVL at the time of recording. Uh, they really caused such a splash uh, with their raise, with their yield. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk like, is it a stable coin? Is it, how do we know if the yield's legit? Uh, what are your thoughts on Athena? Uh, yeah, I thought that Athena was like really, uh, like really interesting take. Um, Me too. Me too. So like it, it is where I say like I feel like I sort of feel like you know DeFi is back when you see something like this launch and just so quickly get to uh, what was it you said three hundred million dollars in like four hundred twenty um, million dollars in like four <laughs> that's, days <laughs> very that's wild. Um, so I think like my thought on it is like um, it's entirely like at the moment like it's entirely like being fueled by the fact that like Ethereum funding rates are so high right like it's like twenty seven percent open interest and that's like where most of that yield is coming from. Uh, I, I'm just kind of like making numbers like up off mm -hmm. the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the actual numbers are. Um, we've also just got through a bear market where like it nearly turned negative. Um, so I'm sure they're going to do great while like everything's oh, doing things. great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's fine. Like that's what, like that's exactly what you want to launch into, right? You want to launch when uh, like you have these conditions, um, get that money in their treasury, figure out what to do for the next, uh, like if the market turns sour, um, but that much money in the treasury, they'll be able to figure something out. So uh, I don't know what the next steps are. They talk about like an insurance fund. Um, I think the big risk that I would be looking at for them is not even just like funding rates turning negative, but just if they go below whatever the DeFi, like quote unquote risk-free rate is, rate right? Is, like at the yeah. moment it's like somewhere around 10% is what you might get on stables. Um, and you could easily see it like falling just short of that and like people just, you know, flying to the next thing, but I, they're smart. They'll figure something out. It's a cool, it's a yeah. cool idea. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, we had Seraphim on the show several weeks ago. Um, I've been seeing in Athena since they first announced probably like a little over a year, probably around a year ago. And their founder was in the frax chat, you know, kind of, I feel like they have the same mentality of being positive some and you know, working with other stables and working together. And so, you know, I'm, I think it'll be a fun experiment and I'm hopeful they'll do well and whatever challenges that they have ahead, they'll figure them out. Yeah. And they have like an amazing team behind them, which I think, you know, mm -hmm. really speaks volumes. Yeah. In DeFi, uh, right? Yeah. And Seraphim said something interesting about BD, which we're both familiar with Garrett. Uh, when I interviewed him, he says something along the lines of when a protocol is starting out, BD is super essential for that initial growth, for that initial getting that attention. Uh, and then eventually, if you're successful, a protocol will reach a certain size and then it's just kind of like maintenance mode. And that's pretty much what happened with Lido. Um, what are your thoughts about BD and crypto uh, as, as it pertains to DeFi? 
It's an interesting question. So like, Curve has been like fairly like famously like developer centric. It uh we only hired our first like full time BD person uh a couple months ago. Um who you should get him on the this chat. He's uh he's a good, he's oh. good uh, person to talk to. Martin oh, Krong. What's his name? Oh, Martin Krong. Okay. I've seen uh, him. You've probably seen him around because he's like a DeFi yeah. crypto OG. He's been in Bitcoin since before me, like twenty twelve. Um okay. so <laughs> yeah. And he lives in Switzerland. Right? So he's um like all the curve team is in Switzerland, pretty much like all the core core team. Um, I like, I think that like curve is like awesome and that it's like succeeded without having placed much of an emphasis on marketing and business development, but it's also like a little bit like, I don't recommend anyone else try like that curve strategy again. Right. It's like, <laughs> like catching lightning in a bottle. Um, I definitely think that like, 99% of the new DeFi protocols out there should probably focus on BD before they even start writing code, in my opinion. Ooh. Um, it's like, it's such a crowded market nowadays. Like when Curve launched and even Frax and all these, like it was such a quiet scene compared to now. <laughs> like um, oh, yeah. nowadays there's so That's much noise. Um, and the only way that you're going to be able to get anything to stand out is if you've just done the very basic like steps of like, is this something that people actually want or need? Um, and the answer to a lot of things is yes, right? Like obviously people needed Athena because like for whatever reason they launched and uh, like 400 million like flocked in within two weeks. So they obviously built something that scratched a niche. Um, I'm not sure that like everyone is building something and they like, they've actually like done that due diligence to say, yeah, there's all these whales out there that are ready to, to go in. And usually what people just want is like high yield. So like, that's easy enough. Like you don't need to be like the smartest person to know that, but there's also other things that like, yeah, I, I don't know. Like the like in in school, I was taught that like if you want to start a company, like the first thing you should do is find your first ten customers, talk to them, um, know what they want inside and out, and if you find ten, that you, there's usually a hundred more just like them. Um, so mm -hmm. that's why I'd encourage people to do it on the BD front. Speaking of uh, you know new products that people want with yield, uh, we saw asymmetry come out recently uh with a bang i i think they're a super unique product because they're boosted lst i mean i had them on alpha bytes uh and hannah's a, a friend of mine uh the, their product wasn't originally like that they cut they just simplified things it's like hey it's all about boosted yield it's all about that number at the end of the day and it's basically s tracks ETH boosted with vlcvx bribes um what are your thoughts uh, new products that combine money Lego Legos like asymmetry and their effects uh, in the ecosystem. Yeah, I'm a big fan of asymmetry. I think they already like filled their cap within yeah, like, a uh, few hours of launch, right? Mm -hmm, they did. So, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get into that one. Um, but um, so, like, there's a few stories there. First of all, is the CVX5, um, who like they're the ones who put it on my radar because they're like, have you I, I, have you talked to them yet? The CVX5. Yeah, no, I, I've talked to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I've, then your audience is probably already familiar. They're basically like this kind of like squad or group of people who are like just big convex fans who decide to come together and like just like start like being almost like the BD wing of convex uh, grassroots. Is that like a fair description of them? Um, and like mm -hmm. figure out like ways that they could like add value to the convex ecosystem. And they come they came across this and did a like great job of kind of convincing um, convincing them to uh like do the 70 30 blend of like staked ethereum and through sfrax eth and uh convex vlcvx uh which is a great idea like it's uh, brilliant the only thing that i worry about with them is like they're still marketing it like to my like eyes it's like a lst uh which it's not straight up an lst right like it has the risk of convex stuff going down i don't think it's one of those things like it's a bull market. Probably everything's going to go up for a bit um, for however long the bull market lasts. So probably no one's going to notice or care. Uh, they're just going to be like, oh, great. This is all going up. But um, but it seems like that might get them into trouble if people are expecting it's like pure Ethereum. Yeah. I, f I mean, I think it's marketed as ETH because the yield on it comes back in ETH. But it's not, it's not pure Ethereum, but I'm not sure how else you would categorize it. People already have a mental model for LSTs in their head. So if they call it something else, they would probably have trouble, you know, getting the message out there about it. 
Yeah, so it's like they sort of have to market it the way they're marketing it. Yeah. Um, so I kind it's of kinda, agree with that. <laughs> it's kind of like with Athena. Like, it's not technically a stable coin. They say it's an internet bond, but it's hard to categorize it as anything else. If you don't call it a stable coin, then, like, well, how do you get people's attention? It's kind of like this catch-22 thing going on here. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, so, like, you know, I, I hope it's super successful. Like, I think it's, like, um, obviously bullish for Convex at the end of the day, right? Like, oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a buy button. Super. It's a constant buy button yeah. for Convex. It's like, all right. <laughs> so, like, I always, like, I always feel like I don't have enough Convex is, like, what it always comes down to um, yeah. <laughs> whenever all these things keep happening. Because yeah. as Frax, Melissa, I'm sure that you're also, like, seeing the, uh, like, the impact that Convex has had on the DeFi ecosystem, and it hasn't like gotten a fair shake. I feel like because no. like, it, the bear market, you know, sapped so much energy from DeFi. Um, but I don't think like there's there's a number of tokens that like I like go to sleep and I'm like I I wish I had more of those tokens. And Convex is always one of those. The Berkshire Hathaway of DeFi, <laughs> it's a, the C CVX Thrive coined that, and I don't think there's a better description of Convex. Uh, you know. <laughs> And they actually expanded uh, the protocols that they support over the bear market, uh, F of X and Prisma. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are your thoughts on this Convex expansion? How do you think it's played out? Uh, why do you think Convex decided to expand? And like, where do you see it going in the future and what it means for these protocols in Convex? Yeah, I mean, it's just utterly brilliant, right? Like, um, like the, the best is. thing you could do <laughs> in the bear market is exactly what they did, right? Like find these like value... Uh, like protocols that will are insanely valuable and going to be insanely valuable and like try and do what you can to like integrate with them. And that's exactly what they did. Um, like, I'm sure that I don't need to tell you this, but like I, the, the, like <laughs> the free market in crypto in the crypto, like, <laughs> okay, not financial advice, right? Like all that, like <laughs> the way the market values these tokens is utterly insane. Right. <laughs> like yeah. th these tokens, like trade, um, it, it's worth it's like i'm not a trader um because like i'd have to like shut off my brain to try and like figure out how sometimes these tokens trade like there's no reason no rational reason for me that like convex should be have fallen as far as it did given how bullish the developments for convex have been over the past like couple of years like though those two just like don't add up to me it seems and still seems super cheap um, convex, like not financial advice, but like go out there and buy some convex. You should <laughs> it's like... change your change your name to Convex Cap at this point. <laughs> I probably That's should, but need. I don't think they could. Uh, I don't think there's room in the CVX five for a sixth member. CVX so. six. <laughs> it sounds like Seal Team six. <laughs> CVX Team six. Yeah. But I think that like the recent redesign of their homepage, like I f hope, um, kind of like communicates to people because I, I get like when i try and think about how people value these tokens i think it's like just like incredibly simplistic right i think they mostly like volume related to ethereum and then like maybe like a rough like market cap next to it i don't think most people realize convex isn't just a conjoined twin of curve right like it has oh, no. tremendous power over curve it also has tremendous power over multiple protocols all of which are like <laughs> building and growing and likely to rip in the bull market here um and convex is like at the catbird seat of all of it. So, like, <laughs> yeah, in a it, way, con yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just like its valuation presently is stupid. <laughs> I think convex helps in in a way institutionalizing voting and governance within protocols. Like the fact mm -hmm. that you have like such a large stakeholder uh, that is in the core team or other you know people in the ecosystem, it helps to centralize it, it a bit, and you know. Now they're so experienced at voting and participating in governance, they're actually quite constructive to go to. Um, for anybody like looking to do anything in the Curve, Frax, F of X, or Prisma ecosystems, all you really have to do, well, not all you really have to do, but what I would highly recommend you do is go to the Convex Discord, you go to you know, CVX voting, the VLCVX voting, and you talk to people there. They're, they're, they're a very active chat. They're always discussing. They would actually really like and encourage people to come over there to, to discuss that they'll appreciate it and it goes a long way i feel like people have this like wrong idea with whales is that oh they're gonna vote how they want no it's not just like that they're gonna listen to the community and vote because there's not just like token power there's like social power and social and, and trust and if like whales vote against their community everyone's be like the fuck like what is this shit and there's gonna be an uproar so it's really that's why it's really important to have your voice heard um 
and it's, it's really you know, easy in crypto like it's really too. easy that's what's mm-hmm. beautiful about it <laughs> like there's no other place where you can like could i could you imagine if i had facebook stock me like causing a fuss and mark zuckerberg answering no there's no <laughs> way but in crypto you can do that you can go and talk to the largest stakeholders and have an impact and have an effect and i think that's what makes this stuff so cool yeah, it's the nice thing about like the like massive explosion of crypto protocols out there is like a lot of them like are craving like a lot of these whales you mentioned they're craving attention they're craving the feedback from their community. Very so. good point. Yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah, because you know sometimes the whales like they only they only can do so much they only know so much and so if they have I guess this is where like future lobbyists come in um, and whatnot it's like they have some guidance on what, like how to vote and where to go like you know you, we'll see we'll see where that goes. Um, yeah, and. How I- do you, I feel yeah, like an, a, another point about Convex that, you know, we, we haven't mentioned is there in terms of product innovation, it's partnership innovation. Because you see here with Curve, they come out with, you know, CRV USD, Llama Land. Then with Frax, you see we release like, you know, eight products o- over the bear market, whereas Convex just pretty much kept the core product itself kind of the same. But it has all of these like other partners to do the innovation for them, which I think is like really smart. You know, in terms of like uh, uh, actually having to innovate, they didn't really. They just found good yeah. projects and gave them the platform. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. It's, so, go ahead. you know, check. Yeah. You know, just like if you haven't looked at the Convex homepage for a bit, like go check it out now and you can kind of like see them spreading their like uh, tentacles throughout DeFi and like <laughs> it starts to make sense, their vision and like they're they're fulfilling and executing this plan very well. Kit, I believe you said that with Curve and VE tokenomics, the tokenomics is the product. And Correct. you know all these protocols have VE tokenomics. Well, if the tokenomics is the product, there's nobody that fits in better into the product that has better product market fit with the product than Convex. You know? Yes, I feel like Convex is like the ultimate SaaS product for VE tokens. Yeah. You know, like it, it just it comes it comes in a pair. Like you kind of have to have both. So it, it's it's really awesome to see the flyway work out. And you know, you, you know, CurveCat, because of you, I'm gonna take an, another look at, at Convex again because I feel like I I have a small like a tiny bag of Convex, but then this conversation had made me realize that their Convex the vision Berkshire is Hathaway. actually yeah exactly <laughs> the Berkshire Hathaway in the making. And you know, yeah. obviously NFA. D-Y-O-R, we are biased, extremely biased. <laughs> so do your own research, everybody. Yeah. Uh, moving on, let's let's get to, uh, you know, Frax and Frax though. Uh, as Curve has been, you know, evolving and shipping product, more products than ever in, on the application level, Frax has decided to go down to the infrastructure roll-up chain level and launch Frax uh, And Sam and team have quite ambitious plans there. Uh, so Curve, Cap, I'm um, Garrett, what are your thoughts on Fraxel? Uh, and what are you looking forward to it? Yeah, I'm very, very bullish on it. Um, so like, uh, basically like this is like the year of L2s, right? Like you probably saw the screenshot where Optimism has like just a web page where anyone can just like click deploy their own L2. So like, <laughs> mm-hmm. obviously we're going to see a lot more L2s coming out. Um, but then the question is like, are the L2s like good or useful? Cause you can imagine 90% of them just fading away. Um, and that's where like, I'm like super bullish on Fraxtal uh, relative to the market of L2s. Uh, Cause I feel like Fraxtal, first of all, is like, it's not just a copy paste fork. Like you have like the block rewards dynamic algorithm and everything um, mixed into that. Um, you have like it tying directly to like Frax and like the entire like tokenomics of the Frax ecosystem. Um, so it's like actually like a piece of a broader strategy as opposed to like just kind of like, hey, we're just going to launch an L2 as a cash grab type thing. Um, so I'm very bullish on where Fraxtal can get to. Um, you have like uh, over a billion dollars locked within the, uh, TVL, locked within the Frax ecosystem. Uh, you'll be able to like start pushing like a lot of that. I my guess is onto onto Frax tool. Um, maybe maybe that's not the roadmap. Maybe you want to keep it like uh, sell in L1. But my hunch is like you're going to start like tapping into that to be able to like allow any developers on Frax to like have access to like the broader Frax TVL. Is that, is that fair? Um, or am I just assuming things? Can you, can you say that one more time? Um, with the, so like right now there's like a billion dollars uh, plus mm-hmm. um, of TVL on Frax on mainnet, right? Yeah. And is, am I right that like the game plan is to like start allowing like some of that to like bleed onto Fraxtal to help out like developers that want to develop on Fraxtal to get access to it? Yeah, I think that's like 
that's part of the vision. I'm not sure how that part's going to be executed. I think the ultimate vision of Fraxel, I'm sure you saw the graphic with Fraxel in the middle and you see Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cosmos, Solana. It's based Fraxel is the final chain of settlement for all Frax assets. And it's basically, atom. it seems like it will be atomically, um, be, I, what's the word I'm looking for? Atomically, you can just like bridge over. There's like, you don't have to bridge over. It's just, everything's native to Fraxel chain. So even if you have Fraxel on Solana or Fraxel on, so on Cosmos chains, it all goes back down to the Fraxel original chain. And so you don't, it basically eliminates all the, the bridging risk because it's just all mm -hmm. natural, natural. I'm not, yeah. I don't know how else to say it. Um, I'm, yeah. I'll probably let Sam speak more on it than myself uh, with ETH Denver coming up. Um, this will be released after ETH Denver, this podcast. So um, what? Are, so with that in mind, uh, what are you looking forward to most at ETH Denver? Uh, what do you expect at ETH Denver? <laughs> I just look forward to seeing just how badly this ages then um, by the time I get back from ETH Denver, right? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> um, I'm sure by then... There's yeah, gonna be a thousand. Uh, like everyone's gonna be trying to get their like um, all their stuff out by uh, ahead of ETH Denver. So I'm sure there's gonna be a thousand announcements between now and then, and this is gonna be obsolete. Um, what am I looking forward to at ETH Denver? Um, so there's the Unstable Summit, uh, which I'm gonna yes. be in town for the first. Oh, day you're, there. you're um, giving me the mantle to host. I I watched your opening speech for the Paris one because I'll be hosting the one in Denver, and I'm just nice. like, okay, what, what should I say? Do you have any advice there? <laughs> I have to admit, one of the things I'm looking forward to is not hosting again. Um, just because, <laughs> like, I always like stress out like um, ahead of whenever I have to do these things and spend like way more time preparing than I should. Um, mm -hmm. So at each CC, like, I had that, and I had this like big talk I had to give. Um, you had a great, you had my favorite talk at each CC. Oh, thank you, thank you. But yeah. the cost was I like locked myself into my shoebox like uh, hotel room for like the entire week beforehand to like prepare and write it out and prep. Um, so I didn't get a chance to like meet people and talk to people uh, and like see what everyone was doing. Um, so I've like kept my schedule a bit lighter this time so I can just like attend and, um, and like enjoy it. Right. Like yeah. actually see what's going on around DeFi. Cause I felt like the people I did meet, I was like a zombie. I was like, hi, uh, hi, gotta go. <laughs> uh, I know how that feels. Uh, do you have any conference pro tips or advice? Oh, you're going to be great. Like you're a natural for this. Um, oh, thank like, you. I'm, uh, I'm super excited to see what you uh, come up with, but like, you know, the I schedule, my, right? I, yeah. I have my outfit prepared. I got, I got a new cherry blossom <laughs> sweater um, that I'm debuting, especially for Denver. I got a bunch of new cherry blossom merch, honestly, cherry blossom shirts. Got to stay nice. on brand. Just have um, fun with it. The one thing I wished I'd done um, in hindsight was like, there was like what between two speakers, I forget what happened, but like there was like a 20 minute block of time that I had to fill. Um, for some reason, like a speaker was delayed or something and I wasn't really ready. Um, and like, I just like was typing into chat GPT and asking it to like give stable coin jokes. And I tried reading those stable coin jokes. Um, uh, they weren't, most of them weren't very good. Um, so like, just like have some like patter in the event that you need to kill time for 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, there's stable coin jokes can go in all kinds of directions, especially with getting pegged. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for like the regular attendees, if someone's, this is their first conference um, or beginning of their conference, like tours and careers and whatnot, what advice would you give them? So um, I, I would say that like conferences like this and like meeting people in person, like I know there's a lot of people who are like anon and just like to like sit at home and contribute in front of their keyboard and never show themselves and which is, it can work great. And that's a good strategy. Um, but there's so much that can happen in person, like just meeting with people, talking oh, with yeah. people. Um, it like really unlocks a lot of these kind of like biz devy type things where like you have an idea, but like you talk to someone in person and then like maybe you get a team around the idea. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think if I were going for the first time and didn't know anything, I would focus on like, they have a lot, like they're really supportive of coders. Um, so I would focus on that. If you're like not a coder, but want to learn, it's a great opportunity too. If you like are a decent coder and you'll probably get even more out of it. So I would like recommend attending the hackathons and all the various builder events. Um, if you know, if you know, absolutely nobody, right. Like, um, cause that, that'll be a great way to get plugged in and meet people and like figure out what's going on. Um, 
And then if you already know people, just like you know, talk to people. <laughs> yeah, talk to people. That's the number one thing. Don't be like <laughs> I've these. I remember when I started going to conferences a few years ago. I just introduced myself to everybody. It's just nonstop, non, and also like the selfie thing. I you got it. If you're gonna, if you want to remember somebody, you gotta take a selfie with them. Have you ever had a moment where you took a selfie with someone a few years ago, and then you see them a few years later, like, oh, you look familiar. You start talking, and and then you like, oh, let's get each other's telegrams. And you notice like two years before that, you guys took a selfie. That's yeah. happened to me multiple times. Yes. Well, you're like a you're like a next level of like crypto celebrity at this point, though. So no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I, but I, I am looking forward to the events that, um, you know, between Stable Summit, App Chain Day, the main conference, a frack still in time. Yes, um, that's the that's the advice I should give to people. If you don't know anything, if it's your first conference, go to the uh, frack still event. Go to the. I actually have a three. Well, we have two fracks events, and then one party at Flywheel. So we have a frack. Well, what? What's the calendar? What's so? I'm not sure. If, I think probably the time this film, so Fraxel in Time, would have happened. But we're actually hope, hosting a happy hour on the last day. Um, That's we're Sunday, right? Sunday. So yeah. we're hosting it um, with the My Guys, like a East stablecoin send off. So nice. Yeah, I'll have to miss that one. I'll be at the Fraxel event for sure. Um, yeah, we'll be doing a kind of like smallish um, live llama party on Friday morning. If you all are up for it, you should stop by. Ooh. I could be, I could be convinced. I'm down for a llama party. Um, I should ask you if you want to like speak on stage at a fractal. I'm trying to see if I can get like a few projects together or like somebody to say like their piece about, you know, what, what they're building, like, Oh, a few minutes, like why they're excited for fractal. Like my whole goal with a, a fractal in time is to get people excited about fractal and the vision of Frax long-term getting everybody in one place and hype them up. That's like my whole, my whole goal with that. So we'll, we'll see. This is a time capsule. We'll see how this goes. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I found weird registering because, okay, so like everyone should also, if you're planning on going for the first time, find the list of side events and just register for everything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know about you, but I found it shocking how many like rabbit holes and niches within DeFi I have, or crypto, I should say, like I have no knowledge of, right? Like I'd apply to like oh, yeah. all these events and I'd be like, I've never heard of this, never heard of that, never heard of that. <laughs> I probably I won't should... end up going to those, obviously. Um, I'm going to self-select into my like little bubble. Um but it really is like choose your own adventure. You could like go into whichever like weird niche you want to. Mm -hmm. And that actually leads well to my next question. Um, what what do you think about all these other categories that have come up into the spotlight, uh, such as AI, DPEN, DSI, D this, D that? Uh, they've really taken center stage, and DeFi has kind of you know kind of just stayed in the same place. Like, what are your what are your thoughts on all these other things taking into the fold? Okay, so I'm super interested in artificial intelligence. Um, I think that if crypto didn't exist, that's probably where I'd be, somewhere around AI. Um, and it's a golden age for AI at the moment. It's um, it's also interesting because it's, you know, it it's a field that has its own kind of problems. Um, like people talk about centralization issues within crypto, um, but I don't see it compared. Like there's huge centralization issues with AI, right? Um, so that's like a whole different beast. Um, but I'm a big, I'm like a big believer that like, we're going to like the current generation of AI is like, it's, it's very amazing. Um, but it's not like, okay. So I, I got, okay. Um, let me like rephrase this when chat GPT kind of broke on the scene. I feel like it like smashed people's expectations of like where AI was right. Like people thought it was like yeah. down here and all of a sudden like people are like, it's up here. And I think we're going to have many more like, similar type like um epiphanies over the next several years at like very rapid pace like where um maybe not even from open ai but just like some organizations are going to be like starting to like use ai in like very mind-bending ways um in terms of like abilities to organize mass amounts of people or or money or um just all sorts of things including some like that will intersect with crypto um yeah what do you think about that intersection between AI and crypto? Because a lot of people see it like, oh, it's a hype cycle. Like, I don't buy it right now. Is there anything legit behind that right now? Or is it just a meme? So a lot of the AI output at the moment is garbage, right? Um, and like, that's probably something you've noticed if you use ChatGPT is like you ask it for like a one line answer and it gives you a 50 line answer. Uh, mm -hmm. So like the problem with AI at the moment is like overabundance. Um, 
whereas crypto is scarcity, right? Like it's about how do you take like mm. precious block space and keep it like scarce. So it's sort of like going to be a natural like um, collision of these two as people like take the like overabundance of AI output and have to like fit it into block space. And it's going to uh... cause the best AIs to win. Uh, so we haven't, I don't think we've yet seen like really exceptional trading bots being built using AI or really MEV bots is going to be the big one. Um, uh, wait, this is interesting. So AI overabundance, you say, say it, give it an input. It's output is like law, whatever. Crypto is all about scarcity because, you know, there's a price on block space. And so when you combine crypto and AI, uh, there's, you can't have that overabundance and you're going to have to like fit it into the block space. And that's where, that's where the magic could happen. It's going to force the AI models to get really, really good. Like only the best AI is going to be able to have room on the chain. Yeah. What do you think of things like Tau? Uh, I actually like finally learned about the history of Tau uh, quite recently. Uh, BitTensor. Have you okay. heard of I'm this? not. I'm not super familiar with Tau. Um, tell us, Dave. Tell yeah. us. From okay, so this is what I know about it. I listened so some back. I listened to an interview with Tekken, like the founder of DAO Five. He used to be a Polychain, and BitTensor started in like late 2020, early 2021, and it was like a, I believe it was like parody chains, like whatever Polkadot is. Um, and each coprocessor is its own parachain. And so if you want like one thing from like one chain, you could like use that one. And Tau is like the, the center of it. Um, so I'm trying to think. I, so I definitely have to do a bit more research. I've just seen a lot of interest around it and it had a fair launch and its genesis sounded like similar to like other successful fair launch projects. Um, and it seems to be the premier i have to do more research on it and i suggest everyone don't take what i said do your own research on it watch that interview with like tech in with uh this, it was a recent podcast interview with him um but sons and i should look into it i'm not an expert but it, it what interests me about ai and like crypto is like all these are just like protocols in, in different ways and like ai is like alert llm protocol and crypto is like a blockchain protocol and it's like how do you combine the two on top of each other yeah, I expect that we're going to see most of the nexus is coming from MEV. I'd be actually MEV. be surprised if it's not happening already, um, just because like, you know, if you get a really like efficient MEV builder uh, using AI to like better identify like the weird transactions and like you know slot their own transactions in, um, it's just a sort of natural like AIs can figure it out better than humans. Yeah, and have you? Um, we were going to say Kit. I don't know. I was just trying to understand, like, uh, what what Garrix is is um, picturing with AI and and blockchain. Because for me, it's more so about like resources. Of you know, AI mm -hmm. is going to consume a ton of resource, and blockchain is the way to divert and and direct where resources go. So, like, I, I agree with you that the overabundance of AI is going to have to like tighten to fit into the constraints of crypto and but crypto is going to be really good at directing where the resource go whether it be block space whether it be gpu processing power or you know whether it be like human power because over time it's prompt engineering that's really gonna kind of take it to the next level as well right and then this prompt engineer also is limited there's so many few people who could prompt well and I'm just seeing like AI overlap in that sense. I never thought about it like, oh, this is AI is going to help this MEV searcher index the blockchain quicker and find opportunities and patterns quicker. I never thought about it like that. Well, yeah, there's like going to be like 50,000 different like L2s out there. Like, and what human is going to have time to go through each of them and figure out like how to build the best oh, that's true. for it, right? Good point. Like, good point. Yeah. But you the can land like, of, a lot of opportunity ahead of us. Yeah, you build the best uh, you know, MEV like AI powered searcher, and you just deploy it and say whichever one makes the most money. That's like where we're gonna put our compute power. It's a it's a money machine. <laughs> it is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When used correctly, um, I feel like AI is just a coordination mechanism to get humanity to create more chips and get more power towards these machines. <laughs> that's that's what AI is. <laughs> it's coordinating. I mean, look at Nvidia. And look at all these different ship companies. Yeah, I mean it's um, yeah AI like so. Did you ever read the um the Kevin Kelly book, What Technology Wants? 
No, I haven't. So this is a pretty good one. It came out like it's, it's, it came out a long time ago, probably even before like uh, crypto was a thing. Um, mm-hmm. But his assertion: this is the Kevin Kelly was the editor in chief of Wired magazine for like decades. Um, mm-hmm. So he's like you know tech a person, and his contention mm-hmm. is that um, the kind of agglomeration of technology is itself a life form of mm-hmm. sorts. Um, is like the sort of like reductive thesis of his book. Um, and like he he brings up a number of things to like uh cite this uh and like but like technology like as like this kind of like life form um it has like wants and needs right it wants to reproduce itself um so mm-hmm. like it's only natural that like ai is driving us towards like driving nvidia prices up to like the moon <laughs> things yeah. like that I could see that's that. what technology wants. It wants better chips. So it's, wants it's better chips. It, yeah. It's breeding humans and like, uh, or put it, it, it's coercing humans into doing so. We made sand think guys. Look where it's got us. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a funny meme the other day or something funny. Like what we thought like AI would be like ending, ending the world. Like, but what AI actually is, is, uh, the, the, the air Canada call, like the AI chatbot made up a policy to calm down an angry customer and they said you'll get a refund but that wasn't the policy so then <laughs> oh and so they this is how ai gets personhood like that was to me like how ai how we think ai gets pers- personhood like oh like all this op- oppression blah 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 how it actually gets personhood no it's actually a separate entity air canada <laughs> says well it's worth remembering that like pretty much every advancement in technology not all but like a lot tend to make the customer the user experience for some of these sites like way worse right um like we thought chatbots in the first place were going to like be like a great thing um because people hate waiting on the phone and now like you have to wait in the chatbot for a million years to connect to an agent who tells you to True. connect to with a phone um and now we're going to be connected to ai chatbots that are going to be making up wrong information <laughs> so it's like there's going to be a lot of bad things like the the end consumer is going to get screwed even harder because that's what drives share prices up in the stock market. Squeezing for the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I remember did you someone. See the, the... Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Garrett. I just remember a story about someone who like had a horrible customer service call with Xfinity, uh, hung up and bought oh. Xfinity stock because they're like, okay, yeah, like <laughs> if they're if they're screwing me over, like they're doing that to improve their bottom line, so they're doing they're doing a good job of it. Oh, that's a good way of thinking. How did the stock do? Like I don't know. <laughs> oh, were you going to say, Kit? Oh, no, I just wanted to ask you guys, like, you know, we're thinking of, about AI, but the one AI that really caught me was like Sora or uh, Sora or, or whatever. Oh, the video the one. Yeah, the, the video one that when I was like, it, you know, because all of us here are kind of like started with, with, with content creation, right? And I just imagine like, imagine it was like a uh, gentleman wearing suit, talking about curve finance uh <laughs> daily runs in front of a desk with a camera light like you know and, and then like come up with a script read twitter every day to see what is the latest and then write a script for me like imagine so, like that was outputted for us like that's crazy <laughs> i will admit i try and use i i so i i, I do use chat gpt every day um i've tried to use it to write my newsletter and it it's not there yet it's not there. Um, yeah it's not yeah Hopefully one day I, I look forward to the day I can go out of business because it'll be better than me. Um, but it'll probably have to come from a model I build and train myself. And as cool as like um, ChatGPT is, like remember that's like just like a portion of AI stuff, right? Like the stuff I'm talking about with um, like MEV bots are just going to be using like advanced TensorFlow, no prompt engineering, just like straight up like numbers, uh, data frames going in and out. Right. Um, so it's been nuts. It's been yeah, crazy. Like, the this the like the level it's at right now with the ability to like talk and basically spout gibberish is just like one small facet of AI. Um, just just like so many other areas of research going on within it. Yeah, it's gonna be exciting to see the future. Um, but I'm not. I think uh, we're getting towards the end of the hour, so I think we're, we can uh, wrap up here. We'll make this a, a quick. A quick pod. Yo, I, actually, uh, David, before we do that, I, I would love to ask Curve Cap, like from his experience like, oh, yeah, launching, like expanding onto L2s, because obviously Curve now oh, yeah, has a suite of products, right? And when you guys kind of uh, approach an L2 and to choose to launch an L2, do you come up with, hey, we're going to first bring the DEX and then we'll bring the CRV USD and then we're going to bring you the, the lending protocol? Or is it like this one fat suite just comes on at once? Yeah, so 
historically, Curve USD contracts haven't really existed on any chain except for mainnet. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you could bridge Curve USD like a, the token to other sure, chains, sure. but like the like the architecture and the minting of Curve USD has all been on mainnet um, for mostly because like Ethereum is sufficiently decentralized, so it's not going to be able to rug. Uh, but a lot of these L2s are like centralized enough that if they wanted, they could just like say, ha ha ha, we're going to like be evil. We control all the sequencers. We're going to like, you know, you know, take this curve USD you minted for ourselves. Um, so for security reasons, um, curve USD couldn't be on side chains other than like just the token being bridged. Um, Llama Lend, however, will be on all the side chains. Um, so the, mm. there's not been like a historical choice between which should we launch. It's just been like, let's launch the decks on there. And then Got it. Uh, the decks gets launched and you know, you'll see like, sometimes like they'll just like launch a couple pools and they won't even like seed it or anything. Um, but every now and then they'll like do like a more proper launch. Like they've done more like Arbitrum base uh, where they like, give some really good rewards, uh, bridge some Curve USD on there, give out Curve USD as Curve as rewards. Um, there's also like a bit of a problem with side chain, uh, side chains in that like since um, some of the bridge hacks, like boosts from Curve hasn't been going to side chains. So that needs to be fixed up uh, before like there could be a proper like L2 strategy. Oh. Um, but I I'm going to guess that in the next like, like suite of things we're going to be also deploying llama land to all the side chains as well so then there will actually be like that full suite of products and i think it'll just be everywhere curve has a dex that'll also have llama land the DeFi oh, trinity man. playing out with curve you guys got the dex <laughs> the, the lending protocol know, and stable coin yeah. rex called it right <laughs> how many I, I i wish there was like a poly market like just like betting on things like would be trends and like frax <laughs> Because like if I just like follow Frax, I can see what what's gonna happen in the future. Like a crystal ball, G5 Trinity, uh, LSTs taking off, L2s. Frax was literally the first to announce and build in that direction, and then you see everyone catch up. And so whatever Frax is like thinking and doing now, um, outside of Frax, I was like, what's in the future? Like you best believe everyone's gonna go in that direction. Yeah, I mean, it's, right. it's nice to see that validation, right? Because we just came off of a two-year bear market. Obviously, the two of you were around for it. Um, I don't know how mm -hmm. you told your family and friends what you were doing, because they probably looked at you <laughs> like you're crazy. Um, but it wasn't now, as bad least... this time around as last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just at, least, like, when... <laughs> but at least when you see like that, like the things people are talking about with Frax, like then play out in the real world, at least you can like say, okay, there's real concrete evidence. I'm not crazy. Like what I'm predicting is happening. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. Uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to what the future has for Frax and for, for Curve, for Convex and, you know, everyone in our little DeFi family. Uh, but I, I still yeah. have, sorry, I have go one ahead, last question in, in regards to, to growth. And I'm like, because, you know, growing a stable coin, I, minting the stable coin arguably is like the easiest part. But the growth and the adoption is when things get extremely challenging and especially with competition, yada, yada. So like I want, I was wondering, what did you find that was most effective in terms of growth for the, the CRV USD? Is it more partnerships? Is it just better yields? Like what did the users want? Yeah, so I think I'd say that at the end of the day, it's like more partnerships is what always makes these things like grow, right? Like it's Metcalf's law. Like if there's one use for the token, whatever, if there's 10 protocols that have adopted it, then some of these protocols will like interact with each other. If there's a hundred, a thousand, like it just gets more valuable, the more protocols adopt it. And really like mm. in our space is time, right? Like Frax has been around for a long time and Frax is now integrated like a kajillion places. And Frax is like among the most like useful, like stable coins out there because like, if I get a Frax, I know that like, there's a lot I can do with it. Like I could keep it as Frax. I could trade it uh, to any number of coins. I could stake it. I could bridge it. Like it's, mm -hmm. it exists everywhere. Um, and I'm very happy to get a Frax. So in the early days of Curve USD, of course, like you couldn't really fake that. Um, but as it's been around for six months, it started to see more and more integration and adoption. Um, so like just that level of like, um, integrations that have already been done have got it i would i would say it's like past this like critical threshold um where i don't think you can kind of undo that so it's kind of but you never know 
was was there like one key integration like oh this this perp dex using crv usd or like this lending protocol taking on was like really that inflection point what was there any moment like that or was it like a slow and steady grinding so honestly in the early days like when convex uh sorry uh when conic finance had about like 70 percent of the curve usd supply mm -hmm. oh yeah that's right like that's right. Uh -huh. that was like okay wow this is like a like meaningful like adoption from this other protocol um when that disappeared overnight like uh that was like kind of spooky um and I kind of wonder what would have happened had that not happened, right? Like if Conic had survived and, you know, Curve USD could be right. 200, 300 million um, at this point if we hadn't had that setback. Um, but I'd say like that, like adoption at the very outset, like was like the like real exciting moment. Um, and then since then, like that disappeared, but like a lot of other protocols kind of stepped up to integrate with it. Silo Finance, um, like immediately mm -hmm. profited the most in Conic's wake by uh, like getting a lot of like curve USD adoption onto it. Uh, from there, it kind of went on to Pendle um, and got into that ecosystem. And then from there, it's kind of like snowballed outwards. And like, there's like dozens of services now that integrated with it. Gotcha. You love to see it. May, may the uh, future of thousands of stable coins commence. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm really bullish. I'm sure you saw it too. Yeah, of course I saw you uh, were writing about it. Like, um, why well, Combinator is not like the friendliest like organization towards crypto, um, but the fact that they're like trying to get more stablecoin adoption, like they they recognize that it's the killer use case of crypto. Oh yeah, I was going to tweet something snarky, but I was like, you know what? I'll just tweet something like friendly and be like, look, you know, stablecoins are here to stay. But you know, I actually Don't be mean what to I tourists, tweeted. guys. Yeah, no, we want to <laughs> encourage people. It's not like, ha, ha I told you so. Yeah. I mean, I, I could imagine we see a tether Bitcoin flipping in our lifetime. Yeah, I could see that. Ooh. Ooh, that's hot. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> that's a hot take. Yeah. Tether's the most successful business of all time. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> Tether's the new Bitcoin. You heard it here first from Curve Cap. <laughs> <laughs> like, could you imagine if it does? Like, I mean,. At, yeah, at this that would rate. mean Tron is the most valuable blockchain in the world <laughs> at that point. Yeah. I mean, that says a lot about strategy and moves in the space um, for Tether to get to that point. And so like Tron being Tether chain, like what that means. And it, I mean, people are already thinking about like, damn, like tr Tether on Tron adoption is massive. It's It was really the adoption that Ethereum hoped to have for their stable coins on Ethereum, but because Tron and is so was cheap. It yeah, was what Bitcoin ahead. was hoping for, right? Like the Bitcoin, Bitcoin was, like, yeah. e -cash, e -cash, was that the yeah, global right. South would adopt Bitcoin as the like hedge against inflation. And they like the market has said they don't care about Bitcoin. They care about stable coins. So yeah, it's pretty wild. Real world use cases. You know, you love to see it. Uh, oh, I had one last question. How, how's everything going uh, at Leviathan? Uh, I remember when we were at East Denver last year, uh, you first proposed to me your idea for Leviathan. Uh, well, it was called Lama News Network, but then you changed it to Leviathan. Uh, how do you think that's gone? Like, what have you learned? Like, how is it different than your standard curve cap newsletter? Yeah, that's really been a blast. Um, so before Leviathan, like for my sake, I kept getting distracted by all the like shiny objects coming out of crypto. Um, so I'd like write these newsletters about like super random protocols or trends I discovered in the crypto space that had nothing to do with curve. And people were like, hey, you know, I subscribe to this for Curve News. Keep it related to Curve. Um, so I took that feedback mm -hmm. to heart. Um, but then there's still all these, like, super interesting, like, things happening, um, which, like, I want to tell people about, right? Like, if I find something cool, I want to share it. Um, so for me, it's been, like, been really nice to have this, like, ability to, like, share some of these, like, cool or interesting things um, that I come across. Um, you know, we've got, like, an awesome team, uh, like, you know, Sam, uh, who's, like, super involved with Flywheel. Uh, he's been like building out the like the podcasting media arm of it. Um, he's like, you know, I, I don't need to tell you, he's like the best in the business. Um, we've got like, yeah, you know, we got like this like loose army of people who like none, no one like commits to doing it full time because we all are like super busy. Um, but all of our powers combined are able to like bootstrap a like uh, functional like news network. Uh, so if any of you are out there and like interested in crypto and want to contribute, please uh, visit Leviathan. Um, you can check out our Telegram headline. It's uh, L underscore uh, LNN underscore headlines. 
uh follow leviathan news on twitter now x um reach out to us there and like uh, ask how you can join like we were building out like i've been spending a lot of time trying to build out this like telegram bot that allows us to like automate all this like uh news headline um intake and quality assurance and output uh so it's been fun for me because i like having like dev projects to work on you heard it here folks go check out leviathan um I'm thinking for oh wait, does anybody have any more questions? Kids, do you have no, any more questions? Good. I'm thinking for this like lightning round, we we go I wanna ask uh Garrett, like what are your predictions going in for to twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five? What's your predictions for the cycle? Um, I do think that it's gonna be bull market season. Um I think all the trends are lining up for twenty twenty four to be like a good year for markets. Um this not all is the best news. I had a lot of fun in the bear. Um the bull markets are not I mean, it's nice like seeing numbers go up, but other than that, like it's like you see all the, plurif- the proliferation of scams, like a lot of people like you see all the tourists, all the tourists come back. You know, it's not as much fun in that level. Um, so like I'm kind of looking, not looking forward to that part. Um, but I do think that we're going to see like I don't know. The last bull market felt like it was interrupted by the Doquan stuff. I don't know if you guys felt the same way. Like yeah, it's I mean that was the like, beginning of the bear. Um, yeah. Yeah, it felt like we had like more room to run. Like we had all these narratives I wanted to see play out that they, we never quite got there. So I'm really hopeful that like this bull market we actually get to fulfill like a lot of the tech promises that people have been talking about, which I think we will, right? Like L2s yeah. are like Ethereum is better positioned to scale now than it was 2 years ago. So like Yeah. Um that's good. Um Honestly, like I think we'll see an Ethereum ETF in the not too distant future. Um, maybe not like May, as soon as May, as some people are hoping. Um, it might be later in 2024, or 2025. I think it's going to hit though. I think it's going to cause the number to go up for Ethereum. I think it's, that's going to cause an alt season for Ethereum. Like all of our tokens will hopefully like catch some of that. So I think it's a good time to mm-hmm. pivot to crypto if you've been in AI for a bit. If you're in AI, pivot to crypto. So funny. <laughs> Oh, um, I, 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 yeah. I got one. I got one. Yeah. Um, do, do you think there will be a re-rate of, of DeFi moving into this re-rate. new cycle? Like people would care about revenue. People would care about like value accrual, like actual, you know, more than just number go up. What people are going to care about, and it's sad to say, is the yields, right? Like that's where Terra came in. They're promising 20% on stables. I think you're going to see that effect unfortunately like there's gonna be new DeFi protocols at launch and they'll promise the highest number they think they can get away with and it will just be more and more DeFi protocols doing that until they one up each other one up each other until it becomes unsustainable and they collapse like <laughs> many such cases nice. um my final it's, it's question. bad for actually all of us because like yeah. i don't see frax going out there and saying we're gonna give 55 percent stable coin yields like because you know frax is like a blue chip and it's been around for what curve's not going to do that right um but there's going to be some like someone who watched sam bankman fried and said i can do that but i can do it right i can um, do it better i can do it better yeah exactly um sure. and this it, it's gonna happen again and it's like it's gonna it's gonna suck <laughs> Yeah. Uh, My uh, final question is, uh, who would you recommend as a guest? Who would you like to see on Flywheel? Uh, I mentioned you should talk to Martin Krung, the business dev guy from Curve. Um, I think he'd be a really good person to talk to. Um, Can we get Mitch on? That would be nice. Uh, He's really tough to pin down. Um, (laughs) Let's see. Who who would I like to hear from? uh, oh, you know who's really good? Viper uh, 4 is launching soon. If you can get Charles Cooper on to talk oh, about it, he'd be really good. What's Viper 4? Uh, Viper, the programming language. It's like oh, a solidity alternative. Fourth, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah the yeah. language. Oh, yeah. They're releasing the beta version of that before ETH Denver, so people will have... It'll be out by now um, for anyone listening to this. Uh, so go uh, play with that. Okay. Wow. That's a good but, angle. Yeah. Go Go deeper into the code. Yeah, yeah, he's um he's really good. Um, Patrick Collins, I think it'd be good to talk to him. Speaking of oh. code, yeah, Chainlink guy, right? Uh, f- former Chainlink. Former yeah. Chainlink. Okay, nice. Those are good Rex. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. kid. Did you have any final? Oh yeah, get Rex. Oh, no. Get Rex too. Logarithmic Rex. <laughs> if you haven't. Oh, he was uh, number two. 
Who's yeah, their who's second, a, who's yes, the second pod? Yeah, yeah. Who's, yeah, who's okay. bullish? But get him yeah, back. Get no, him no. back. <laughs> yeah, this is such a great pod. Like I, I, I miss talking with you, Kurt. I, I, I think yeah. we should totally have you on at least like ha- once every six months, just to do like a vibe session. Is yeah. is what the doctor's ordering? Or maybe we can have like Kurt, Curve Cap co-host while you're away, kid. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that offline. We'll yeah, talk yeah, about that better. offline. Yeah, yeah. Only if you give me a Patagonia beanie. <laughs> so, yeah. What color? Um, I'll send it. <laughs> uh, before we go, uh, Garrett, where can people find you? Where can people learn more about Curve? Um, so follow me on X, uh, just Curve Cap, all one word. Uh, if you want to learn more about Curve, you can go to my uh, my blog. It's curve.substack.com. I publish there weekdays, except holidays, and those will probably be the best places to find me. So you heard it here. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much for coming on again, and uh, we'll see you in Denver. Looking forward to it. See you guys there. Yeah. See you. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Post Game Show. I'm your host, Steve by Dave. Here, as always, with Capital K, we're wrapping up another episode with Curve Cap, Garrett Hall, the Curve Maximalist, giving his takes of everything Curve ecosystem, giving his takes in DeFi, interesting money Legos being built, interesting AI things developing. We went into, we went all over the place with this one. Uh, Kit, what are your thoughts? Man, I just said it was just a great vibe session talking with yeah, we're just like, like-minded. We're- like it, it's so good. We literally talked about everything like serious, like business development, tax and tips, and then also all the way down to like, hey, what do you think about this? Or how about you know what's let's 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 do some bull market math and <laughs> you know it was, it was nice. Yeah, no, it's Garrett's a friend of the show. Uh, you know, it's always a treat having him on. It's always a treat seeing him in person. Uh, someone I feel like we see eye to eye with. He understands, uh, you know, the triumphs, the trials, the tribulations, the ups, the downs, everything in, in between when it comes to being in our little corner of DeFi. So it's always great having him on. Uh, what were some insights you got uh, from this? Is there like a favorite point of this episode? <sighs> Let me think about this one. Um, you go first. You go first. Let me think on this. Um. Something that comes to mind is I mean, you made me think about AI differently. Uh, it sounds oh, like he was looking at mind. like practical uses of AI and crypto, and like the first practical use is obviously MEV bots. Getting and you're not going to be able to scour every roll up in every chain, so getting an MEV bot to do that automatically makes logical sense. Yeah, you, you know, I never thought about AI in that sense. I guess I was so used to the consumer application of it, um, and not like mm-hmm. the AI. Yeah. And and w- when I think of AI and crypto, I think of it as like resource management. Like I said on the pod, where it's like GPUs uh, allocating where those GPU things go. That's why you know Filecoin, Arweave, and all of those things are like you know, render, for example, also. Um, yeah, render yeah. all that stuff. I need to read up on Tao. I got to get a better description of that. I thought I did an okay job. I could have probably done, done a bit better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's amazing how much crypto has grown as an industry. It's like it used to, even four years ago, it's like I can't keep up with everything. Now I definitely can't keep up with everything. Yeah, it's, impossible. You know, you got to pick your impossible. niche and then kind of stick to it. Yeah. I, is it even worth keeping up with everything you think, or is it better like, like cause now there's all, like, ch- there's multiple chains that are like now, like, you know, they're, they're here to stay. Like if they're like, you could like, you have Ethereum, you have Solana. Now you have like other things coming out. Like, is it even worth it trying to like play on all these different chains? It's like, you're going to like a different country. A hundred percent. So I, I think you, you should pick like one home country and then you should have like vacation homes. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think like like yeah, a handful. Yeah, I think if you're a trader, it doesn't matter. If you're a yeah. trader, you just see a trade. It doesn't matter what chain it's on. It could be on fucking hex, True. honestly. <laughs> but if you're an True. educator, if you're more of a builder, more of a missionary, you definitely should have a a home base, a home chain, and uh, yeah. you know you can explore, you can appreciate. It's like everybody has their own religion, but you can still like you know I, I'm Jewish. I, I go visit a mosque or visit a church sometime. You know, I can appreciate mm-hmm. the beauty uh, in those buildings. You can do the same thing with chains. Uh, it doesn't have to be so divisive um, all the time. Yeah. But, but keeping an open mind, I, I think an is, open is, mind. is the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Don't right? be like, a maxi. Don't be a maxi. Yeah. You can, you can have your values, but don't, you know, 
what's what's the word what's the phrase uh strong opinions loosely held is that the phrase yeah weekly held weekly held weekly held yeah um anyways uh but this was a fun one great i'm excited to see curve cap uh in denver um passing the torch on hosting stable summit i'm kind of nervous i'm a little bit nervous for stable summit but like i like um I just like the the pre jitters and stuff, but like I'm actually like looking. I think he gave good advice. Just he was like, James, just have fun, just have fun." So I'm just gonna have fun. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to like go back on this pod and think. Like, watch this later uh, after stable something after each time and be like, "Oh wow!" Like you know, there's no sense in being nervous at all. It's everything's gonna be. It was a terrible gonna work experience. <laughs> and if it, if it is a terrible experience, I can laugh about it. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it was great having Garrett back on the pod. Uh, and if you want to see him again, if you want to see all our episodes, uh, make sure you go ahead, subscribe, hit that like button, leave us a comment, let us know what you think. Go to our website, flyodefi.com, subscribe to that. You will thank yourself later for all the fracks in DeFi Alpha. Make sure you follow us on all our socials, at FlyableDeFi on Twitter, TikTok, and Telegram. Follow us on Farcaster, at Flywheel. And make sure you can follow me, yours truly, on Twitter at DeFi Dave 22 and on Farcaster at DeFi Dave. You can follow me at 0x capital underscore K. And we'll see you next week. I love that. Everything said on this episode is not financial or tax advice. This channel is strictly for educational purposes and it's not in investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any assets or to make any financial decisions. This video is not tax advice whatsoever. Please talk to your accountant and do your own research.